My name is Gwener Geliak, and this is Hush Talks. I am an assistant professor at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And today I'm going to report on a work that we've done recently in the lab looking at gene therapy for Usher syndrome type 1C. In the lab, we've been studying hearing and deafness, and we've been looking at the role of different genes that are important for the sensory cells and the neurons of the auditory organ and the vestibular organ to function. In particular, I've been interested in Usher syndrome, and more specifically recently on Usher syndrome type 1C, and a mutation that is common in patients that are found in Louisiana of Acadian descent. This mutation is called 216G2A, and a mouse model of this mutation was developed by Jennifer Lance and Bronya Kitts many years ago. They had characterized this model, and we further characterized it, looking at hearing balance, histology, and physiology. We then developed gene therapy vectors specific for this mutation. To evaluate the therapeutic benefit, we performed auditory and balance testing, performed cellular physiology assay, looking at imaging of the sensory cells, and we also performed molecular work. So this gene is expressed, the Usher 1C gene, is expressed in the auditory organ and the vestibular organ, from the base to the apex of the cochlea, as well as here in the vestibular organ, in the sacral and the ampullas. It's expressed in all types of sensory cells, and here are shown, uh, is shown a cross-section of the auditory organ, where we see that ammonin is expressed in outer air cells and inner air cells. This is here also seen in the uh, scanning electron microscope here that also depict the structure at the tip of the hair cells, which is called the stereociliary structure or hair bundle, which is essential for sensing the displacements of the liquid that is transmitted through uh, uh, sound waves to the auditory organ. So the goal was to develop specific vectors for this gene. So we prepared gene sequences, which we packaged into a vector that was developed by Luke Vandenberg, and transferred these vectors through the round window of the mouse. We had demonstrated that the vector we were using was excellent in targeting inner and outer cells, and this is seen here in green. This is a vector driving the green fluorescent and protein. So we can see that the vector is ex excellent in driving expression of a gene to a specific target. So we package this vector, this, um, the sequences in this vector. We injected the mice after birth and we let them recover. Six weeks later, we first observed the mice in an open field, which is an open chamber of 42 centimeter. Here in the upper panel, you can see mice that are freely moving in an open chamber. We have a mutant mouse on the left and a control mouse on the right. The control mouse actually possess one alle mutated allele, but behaves like normal mice. And so what we typically see in a white type mouse is that the mice is uh, moving around freely, it's pretty calm, and it doesn't have circling behavior. And it mostly stays in the periphery of the chamber. Now, if you look at the mutant mouse, you can see repeated circling behavior. The movements are a lot more hectic as well. When we look at the mutant mice after treatment in the bottom panel, this is two examples. The mice have received the vector treatment uh, um, right after birth, and this is here observing them at six weeks of age. And we can see that they behave a lot more like the control mouse. They do not circle anymore like the mutant did. And we attribute this behavior uh, mostly to a vestibular recovery, so a recovery of the balance function. We also perform auditory brainstem responses. This is done in anesthetized mice, which are allowed to recover after the recording. We apply sounds from 10 decibels, a whisper, to 120 decibels, a very loud sound. In control mice, we can see that we can record electrical responses at sounds as low as 20 decibels. The response increases in amplitude as you increase the sound level. In mutant mice, despite increasing the exposure to up to 110 decibels, 
we do not see any electrical response, showing that the mutant mice are fully deaf. In the treated mice now, we can observe electrical responses as low as 30 dB and clearly by 35 dB here, and the response again increases in amplitude as we increase the sound exposure. So we can see that we've um, successfully rescued hearing loss mice to a level that's very close to the control mouse. So this is, this is unprecedented, such a recovery has never been seen before. Um, so we're really thrilled by this result. We then performed cellular physiology. Um, we dissect out the cochlea, put it in, our, in a recording chamber under a microscope, and we can record from the sensory cells from each cell while displacing the uh, sensory air bundle at the apical surface. And this basically mimics what would occur during the propagation of a sound wave. When we apply a stimulus, we displace the bundle towards the total stereocilia. We see an increase in the current that corresponds to the ions coming into the cells, which would eventually depolarize the cell. If we apply different level of stimulus, we can see an increase in the current uh, gradually with increasing stimuli. When we look at the mutant mouse, we can see that the currents have been drastically reduced. However, after treatment, we can see that we've recovered the currents close to the control, control mouse. So this shows that we've rescued the sensory health cells, and this likely has led to the recovery of the auditory and vestibular function. Furthermore, if we look at imaging and the structure of the stereociliary bundle, we can see um, in the control mice, we have normal structures and stereociliary bundle that possess three rows of stereocilia. I colored them here to show you the three different rows of stereocilia. In the mutant mice, the structure is quite disorganized, a lot of cells have died, and we've completely lost this nice structure that was seen in the control mice. What happened after treatment? We can see that we have recovered a lot of sensory cells, and the three rows of stereocilia are now present in the mice that have been treated after birth. So we recovered also morphology of the stereocilia bundle. Finally, we perform molecular work, and what we did here is look at expression of RNA, which is a genetic message that will lead to the expression of the protein. We can see that there is mostly aberrant, protein, uh, aberrant sorry, RNA detected in a mutant mouse. After treatment, we can now detect the normal RNA encoding for the normal protein. What about the protein itself? We use a technique called immunohistochemistry. And in green, we can see uh, the antibody that labels specifically uh, almonin. In red, we have the actin just to show where the tissue is. You can see that expression of almonin is normal in a control mice. It's absent in a mutant mice, but recovered after treatment. So in summary, we have developed gene therapy vectors specific for the Usher1C mutation, the 216G2A Usher1C mutation. We have seen rescue of auditory and balance function. We observe rescue of mechanosensation in the sensory hair cells. We've increased survival of sensory hair cells and observed recovery of hair bundle morphology. We also see normal RNA and protein in the treated mice. So before I conclude and thank our sponsors and the people who've done this work, I just want to um, say how grateful I am for being given the opportunity to work on this project, and we are extremely encouraged by the results we've seen. At the same time, we want to be very cautious. It's uh, going to take a, a lot more work to know whether any of the work uh, that we've done is eventually going to be applicable for human treatment. Um, in particular, we want to know whether this work um, could uh, be translated to larger animals um, before we can move on to, to humans. The work was sponsored um, by Boston Children's Hospital, the Kids Be Kids Foundation, the Foundation Fighting Blindness, as well as the Foundation Berta Rally. Many people have taken part in this work. In my lab, Bifeng Pan, a physiologist, Charlie Askew, Alice Garvin, Carl Nitzland, Selena Emanaka, Yukako Asai, and Jeffrey Holt, who is my colleague and collaborator as well as collaborators at LSU, Jennifer Lance, 
Chicago Medical School, Michelle Asting and Francis Jodelka, the Masayan here in Boston, Luke Vandenberg, who um, developed the vectors that we use for this study, and uh, HMS Harvard Medical School Boston, Archer and Zikulian, who performed the scanning electron microscopy. Thank you for your attention.